Regime Types and War. Here you can see the burning of the British fleet at Medway. At the conclusion of the Anglo-Dutch Wars, the British Democratic Parliament, albeit all oligarchical because you didn't have universal suffrage, decided to save money by putting the entire uh, fleet into storage. The Dutch, in a surprise attack, took their fleet up the Medway, overcame the very small British garrison, burned most of the fleet, and stole the, uh, the flagship of the British fleet. And it was the most humiliating defeat of British arms and was largely the result of the fact that the British had a democracy and therefore were cheap. On the other hand, the Dutch also had a democracy and uh, they were inventive and aggressive and they managed to do this. So what we're interested in is regime types and war. Does the type of government you have influence your combat performance? Whether it's a dictatorship or a democracy. So the historical conventional wisdom has been that democracies are weakened by their system of consensual politics. People discussing and talking and having weak leaders and having to make sure that everyone's willing to follow along with the policy. Thucydides in the Peloponnesian War argued that democracies like Athens were incapable of preparing for war efficiently and beating uh, a non-democracy like Sparta, which had a much more um, a streamed decision-making process from the Spartan kings to the military directly. This pessimism was shared by French thinker Alexis de Tocqueville, uh, E.H. Carr, who saw dictatorships as having an advantage, such as Germany, Japan, and Italy, uh, who can choose when to attack. George F. Kennan, uh, who designed the containment policy against the Soviet Union, also had a Cold War pessimism about democracy. Now Herodotus, the Greek historian, disagreed, and he argued that Athenians were average warriors as tyrants, but much better warriors when democratic. And he saw this in his account of the Greek resistance to the Persian Empire's invasion. Now, the source of the information we're going to be looking at comes from a book, Democracies at War, by uh, Dan Rader and Alan C. Stamm. And what they do is a statistical study relying on three interrelated data sets. Ted Robert Gurr's Polity 3 data set, which provides values for the regime types. The MID data set, which provides information on the wars. And Trevor Dupuy's Hero data set, which provides data on the outcomes of wars and battles. And so for all of the hypotheses below, you can always look at the posted bibliography uh, for this particular subject. So let's take a look at the uh, competing hypotheses. The first is regime decision making. Let's look at the first hypothesis, which is that democracies are more likely to win wars. Well, the explanation is that for all of the hypotheses to be examined below, democracies are better at making and winning war than authoritarian and totalitarian states, including states led by military regimes, according to the data collected by Alan C. Stam and Dan Rader. The findings are as such. The statistical evidence indicates that democracies are more likely to win wars than non-democracies. They find that 31 wars involving democracies, those are three that that are excluded as draws, including the Korean War, the 1969 War of Attrition between Israel and Egypt, and the 1982 uh, Lebanon War between Israel, uh, Lebanon, and Syria. Democracies won 23 or 28 out, out of 28 wars, or 82%. So we can see here the winning percentage for initiator wars by regime type. So dictators Dictatorships typically won 60% of the wars that they initiated. Uh, oligarchs won 58%. Democracies won 93%. What does it mean? It means that democracies pick the right wars to win uh, for a total of 65% uh, for war initiators. So two thirds of the time when you choose to fight a war, you guess correctly. And one third of the time you failed to correct guessly. Now, dictatorships win only 34% of the time when they're targets. In other words, they're very bad at deterrence. Oligarchs are not quite as bad, and uh, we, where we conceive of oligarchs as less narrow than dictatorships, but not quite as broadly representative of society as democracy. 
So democracies are uh, two-thirds likely to prevail if attacked, but overwhelmingly likely to win if they initiate the attack first. Now this is the probability of victory by dem democracy scores. So as a society goes from very non-democratic, which is minus 10 on the horizontal line, to very democratic, which is 10 on the line, you can see that when it's extremely undemocratic, it's got a reasonable chance of winning. But then when it dips down, uh, it actually has uh, less of a probability of winning. And then you have a gradual rise uh, until you have an extremely high chance of winning as a democracy. So democracies uh, across this whole band actually do quite well. But there are instances at the extreme levels where totalitarian states that are hypercentrally controlled like North Korea can do well also because there's an opportunity to implement a good plan if there is a good plan available. So this is the probability of victory of a democracy by scores of target states. So you can see uh, here, again, you have the horizontal line, which is democracy, and the vertical line is the probability of victory. And you can see that uh, democracies do well. Uh, they have a higher probability of winning, and countries that are not democratic generally have a lower chance of winning. Now, there are always individual exceptions. There were plenty of democratic defeats. 1897 Greco-Turkish War, 1939-1940 Russo-Turk-Finnish War, the 1962 Sino-Indian War. Democracy was not enough to make up for the power imbalance for the states in these particular instances. Evidence of a curvilinear relationship exists. Most democratic and most authoritarian states win wars, but median states are those that tend to lose. This may be because they're transitional or they're unconsolidated regimes, and so they're either weak democracies or they're authoritarian states that are evolving out of centralized control. So here you can see this curvilinear relationship in democracy scores and victory, where you're going to get wins on the extreme left, which is authoritarian states, and on the extreme right, uh, which is democratic states, but in the center you're not going to get a lot of victories. The second hypothesis is that democracies are better at picking wars um, that they can win than non-democracies. And the explanation here is that democracy, democratic regimes suffer fewer bureaucratic dysfunctions than non-democratic states and have more open decision-making processes. A democratic state is more likely to have a balanced constitution that incorporates the influence of the electorate, industrial interests, the foreign ministry, and the military. Totalitarian states are likely to subordinate the concerns of everything to ideology. Authoritarian states may either give the military too much or too little influence and will ignore the electorate. Military regimes tend to marginalize the foreign ministry except to buy weapons and get foreign aid. Democracies, therefore, evaluate the outcome of a policy more fully. This is because the electorate, which would normally suffer the consequences of a war in having to serve and die and in their tax money, have a major incentive to become involved. So what are the general findings? Democratic states are not more efficient in military affairs. They formulate strategy no more efficiently than non-democracies. Now there's a counter case. Israel in 1967 was a good selected war. But the Israelis did not select war well in 1956 or 1982, where they didn't achieve their objectives. Democracies win wars, uh, more wars if they are the initiator, which is sort of obvious. I mean, if you get to pick the wars you, you, you start and you can avoid the wars you don't want to, then, of course, you're going to win more often. Democracies initiate wars of shorter duration and they suffer fewer casualties. So it looks like democracies choose wars where they think they can win and non-democracies end up getting stuck in very long conflicts. The more the level of public participation, the greater the likelihood of successful decisions. So here you can see that when you're looking at a war in terms of how long it lasts, democracies have a distinct advantage if they get involved in wars that are about 15 or 16 months or shorter. But when you get involved in longer wars, the likelihood that democracy is going to succeed drops off precipitously.
And when you're getting out to 60 months, which is a five-year war, democracies have a very low chance of success, where non-democracies are far more likely to prevail. So you think of long conflicts like the Iran-Iraq war, it's questionable whether a democracy could have fought that long. When the, when the democracies fought their long war in World War I and World War II, they ended their wars faster than the Iran-Iraq war. Hypothesis three, authoritarian leaders are more likely to begin risky wars. And when we mean risky, we mean risky to the regime's survival. In other words, the, the leader starts a war, uh, the country fails, and then the people may turn on the government for having failed uh, to win. The explanation is that democratic leaders suffer audience costs. This is when a leader makes a promise to the population and then fails to keep their promise. So making public promises is a way of, that the leader commits to show that they have an objective. But it can have a consequence if you're not able to carry through. And so leaders will suffer the costs of failure. Democrats have less experience in staying in power, whereas autocrats are more likely to remain in power after defeat. Now, this is in part because of the costs of being deposed. Democratic leaders will simply retire uh, to their law office and write their memoirs, where uh, leaders of authoritarian states will likely get shot. So what are the findings? Well, there's no clear correlation. Public consent is important in democracies, but popular support does not matter in autocracies, though it is attenuated by paternalistic client networks. In other words, you do have some link between the government and the society, and different authoritarian regimes have greater or more narrow access to the population or suppress a smaller or a larger portion of it. Hypothesis four. Democracies build overwhelming coalitions against their enemies, whereas authoritarian states have less cooperative aspirations with other authoritarian states. In other words, democracies form stronger alliances. So what's the explanation? Well, as per the democratic peace, democracies have normative and structural reasons not to make war with other democracies. Autocracies tend to create overwhelming coalitions against themselves, more due to their strategic planning deficiency than the nature of democracy per se. In other words, Germany and Japan were nationalists. Because they're nationalists, they don't care about anyone, so they adopt extreme policies that are confrontational. They annoy all of their neighbors, and so instead of fighting two or three countries, they end up fighting everybody at the same time. And this occurred twice for Germany, the First and the Second World Wars. So democracies are not more peaceful than non-democracies. The English engaged in a great many colonial campaigns against uh, smaller territories that were incorporated into their empire. And democracies engage in genocidal conflicts, like some of the conquests um, during the colonial era. Um, so democracies are not necessarily peaceful, they just pick battles where they're not attacking everybody at the same time. When England attacked or was attacked by everybody at the same time, which is what it did during the Seven Years War when it supported Prussia, the French and the Spanish got revenge on England during the American War of Independence and used their fleets to keep the British at bay long enough for the Americans to achieve independence. So there is a price. If you attack everybody, they will attack you back and revenge wars are real. So what are the findings? Well, the debate continues as to whether democracies make better allies or not. First of all, international links between democracies are rather weak. Uh, they conduct covert operations against each other. For example, Israel recently spied on France. Uh, the Americans use intelligence to spy on the French, also doing trade negotiations. Uh, and they don't ally with democracies more than non-democracies. I mean, the U.S. has allies like Japan and Germany, which are democratic. The U.S. also has allies like uh, uh, Saudi Arabia, for example. Um, Israel and England made common cause with uh, undemocratic South Africa during the Cold War. The Israelis got the uranium from South Africa for their nuclear weapons program, uh, and the English relied 
uh, to some extent with other European countries to um, make use of South Africa to protect the oil from the Persian Gulf that couldn't fit through the Suez Canal because it was blocked in the 1967 war and therefore had to go around the Cape of Good Hope near Cape Town. As well, democracies make better allies. They share values of cooperation and amity and so easily form alliances in a way that's not so easily formed between fascist, country, fascist countries. Spain did not join uh, Nazi Germany, despite the fact that the Germans and the Italians were vital in Francesco Franco's uh, survival and eventual victory in the Spanish Civil War. The common values led the English and the French and the Americans to ally in both world wars. At the beginning of the First World War, the um, Americans generally saw the world as divided along the lines of culture related to whether they were Mediterranean or Alpine. And the Americans uh, uh, had this, you know, you can, you can see this type of cultural perspective in areas like the, uh, uh, the, um, the Encyclopedia Britannica. Now, what the Americans wanted to do, specific, uh, specifically the American President Woodrow Wilson, was to redefine France's role from a Mediterranean society and Germany from an efficient Teutonic society, which is what the Americans identified with, to a non-democratic and democratic society. And so U.S. President Wilson launched a propaganda campaign, and this included targeting Germanophiles. And the Columbia University's president was a man called Burgess, who supported this Teutonic, non-Teutonic Mediterranean perspective, and he was eventually pushed out and fired from uh, his job at Columbia University. So values do matter for uh, democracies. The fifth hypothesis is regime economic factors. Democracies have bigger economies, they can extract more, they can deliver weapons more efficiently, and they can mobilize larger armies. Right? And this is actually a debate between um, two uh, uh, scholars of, uh, of political economy and war, and that's Millward and Overy. Uh, over who can mobilize more. Millward argued that democracies can mobilize enormous resources and largely following the logic of Mansur Olson on the, the superior bureaucracy of democracies. And Overy argued the opposite, that democracy led to a dramatic drop in the service industries. And so the British economy actually contracted um, uh, at the outbreak of World War II, where Millward said the British economy actually grew. So what's the explanation? Well, democracy is a tendency to support liberal market capitalism, which is the most efficient method of production since the 19th century for countries that need to innovate economically. Democracies are less prone to rent seek, where a faction in society captures a portion of the state to collect rents or access fees to sustain themselves, and is less likely to distort their markets that lead to reduced economic efficiency. However, there is evidence that democracies have relative rent-seeking tendencies, including principal agent problems and include moral hazards. For example, uh, most North American cities used to have trams, and that was efficient. And then a coalition that was uh, on, on the level of a criminal racketeering organization between Firestone Tires, General Motors, and American oil companies created bus companies that undersold the tramways, putting them out of business in the majority of cities in North America. In the late 1950s, the U.S. court found the, uh, the, the, the companies guilty uh, in a court case brought by the U.S. government, but by then it was too late. Well, the U.S. failure in Vietnam and the British success in the Boer War in Malaya had to do with the fact that parliamentary systems are less dysfunctional than presidential systems when it comes to the prosecution of counterinsurgency, according to some scholars. Now, in Latin America, Douglas North and Barbara Geddes both argue that the presidential systems of Latin American states are clientelist. In other words, you've got a leader and they've got followers and the leader is expected to bring resources from the center core of the state to these outlying support people. Now, this is despite a system of constitutional checks and balances. In other words, people break the rules. These systems produce rent-seeking that keeps soft authoritarian states and democracies with wide income distributions from winning wars against other democracies. Now, there is evidence that democracy is the product 
rather than the producer of wealth. So at some point when a country is wealthy enough, people will push for a democratic system. Now there's a counter case. Israeli democracy did not stop it from rent seeking and having a high level of intervention in the economy up until the 1980s with its socialist governments. Well, its labor uh, regimes. So what are the general findings? Democracies do not devote more material to war or do so more efficiently than non-democracies. Democracies do have superior logistics initially in war, but this may simply be because naval powers tend to have more experience with logistics because of the distances involved, and most of the great naval powers have been democracies. Hypothesis 6. Democracies provide their militaries better technology. The explanation is that liberal market capitalism provides better economic incentives for creating technology. What are the findings? While democracies tend to be most technologically advanced at the moment and was a reason in part why the Soviet Union chose to reform, there's no clear correlation here. Totalitarian Germany during the Second World War led in most technological areas except cryptography and nuclear weapons. Regime durability factors. Hypothesis 7. The longer the war continues, democracies are more likely than autocracies to seek an end to the war, even if it means a draw or a mild defeat rather than a victory. The explanation is that autocracies have a better state instrument to bear a long disruptive war from their civil populations. Democracies seek short wars and are not well adapted to survival in wars that have a long timeline. And what are the findings? Well, democracies do in fact uh, choose to engage in shorter wars. Democracies tend to engage in shorter wars, and you can see this in the chart. Democracies are more likely to settle for draws than non-democracies. And this difference here is significant. So the prevailing evidence uh, is that support for war is usually inversely related to the log of the casualties. And that this is a good predictor for war termination. An alternative approach argues that marginal casualties better capture the shocks that drive the opposition to a war in democracy. Uh, the marginal casualties means the difference from the casualties of the previous time period, where a, a log of casualties generally um, reduces uh, the arithmetic change to a much smoother, slower change. So an explanation is that once losses start to drop, those opposed to the war will retain their opposition, but will then oppose the war because of cumulative sunk costs. So autocracies are more likely, therefore, to obtain decisive rather than draw outcomes. So here we have losses uh, during World War II. Uh, the first are the casualties, and the second is the log of the losses. Here we have U.S. marginal losses in Korea, and then U.S. log of the losses. And here you can see the uh, U.S. losses and public support for the war in Vietnam, and they're fairly closely related. And you can see the marginal casualties. And this sort of fits with the disapproval rating. And then you can see the log of uh, cumulative casualties. The eighth hypothesis is that the longer the war, the more likely the autocracies will win. And the explanation is the same as above, which is authoritarian states can better endure the suffering of war. The findings are that, well, evidence uh, along one dimension only, and that's the chances of victory drop as public support drops for war and democracy. And here you can see that the probability of uh, democratic initiators being victors over non-democracies over time. So microstructural factors. Hypothesis 9. Democracy creates better leaders and soldiers willing to make use of initiative on the battlefield, which increases military performance. Well, the explanation is that democracies and market capitalism 
uh, uh, require their citizens to think for themselves. And this generates initiative, which is an important ingredient of battlefield success. So the findings are that democracies fight with better leadership and initiative than non-democracies, but this advantage diminishes over time. There's counter evidence that some of the leading autocracies have greater initiative, such as Germany and Japan. And then countries like the Soviet Union, which were very authoritarian, totalitarian in fact, learned how to fight on the battlefield to the extent they could defeat the Germans. Hypothesis 10. Soldiers fight harder for democracies because they identify more closely with their regimes. And the explanation is that wars tend to start with a popular rally around the flag effect, which increases the popularity of the leadership and increases the cohesion of society through in-groupism and out-groupism. Democratic soldiers fight with higher morale when they understand and believe the cause they are fighting for and the cause is self-serving. Particularly, we're fighting to bring back peace. We're fighting to bring stability. We're fighting for the, our rights. We're fighting to not be conquered. So what are the findings? No evidence exists that democracies have better morale than autocracies, and it does not depend on whether the war occurs on home or foreign territory. Nationalism is a potent source of effectiveness for democratic and non-democratic states and seems to be far more important than the type of regime that you have. An example is Israel's widespread support for its wars, and this was the result of common fate and nationalism, not democracy. Hypothesis 11. Democracies do not generate better skilled soldiers. The explanation here is, the most likely explanation, is that social culture matters more than political culture and structure in determining performance. And the findings are, although there appears to be no correlation with poorly skilled soldiers being produced by both democracies and autocracies, the best soldiers consistently come from states with autocratic political systems. It was generally believed that autocracies were better predisposed to fashioning the organizations militaries needed to perform well. The problem is that it can work the other way. Autocratic regimes select military officers on the basis of loyalty rather than competence, creating militaries that perform less well even than democracies. Alfred Thayer Mahan, the uh, thinker of naval strategy, believed that democracies um, generally made navies and armies less prepared for war. But on the one hand, you have uh, Nazi Germany, which was very efficient, and then you have Italy, which was far less efficient, and they were both fascist states. And it seems that it's not regime that explains the variation there, but culture. Hypothesis 12. Democracies have better intelligence during war. And the explanation is democracies are more open societies and therefore make better use of the available information. Now, the British did break the German strategic code through ultra, and the US broke the Japanese strategic code through magic in the Second World War. However, German naval intelligence repeatedly broke the British naval code and predicted allied behavior more accurately than the allies could predict German planning. And so the findings are, uh, it doesn't seem to be true uh, either way in this instance. 